oh yeah, that can happen. And it showed up a lot last year because it had the great kind of weather. Well, in some cases it looked pretty severe. And this was a picture I borrowed from the fair people that shows the seeds, seedlings eight days after. And you can see they look pretty tough. And then you can see 16 days later, things are looking good again. And here was 43 days later, everything's off the races. We really didn't miss, miss a beat there. But there was still a lot of anxiety out there. And then the other thing on top of that is, does anybody have an idea what's going on with this bee? <coughs> here's another picture of it. And here's another picture of it as it's growing out of it. This is actually our soil applied PPO herbicides. Awesome herbicides for water hemp. We need them. But if you get cool, damp weather, some about the time they're popping out of the ground or slightly after, and you get a hard driving rain, guess what? going to see this symptom. Sometimes it's worse than others, but not an uncommon event. So last year what was happening is we were getting this symptom along with the halo effect. And you know how uh, maybe when you were going to school they switched to modern math and none of us knew how to do modern math so we do it the old way. Well, one and one equals three. Well, that's kind of what this was. And so I pulled up some data and Purdue actually did some studies on this looking at the interaction between the PPO herbicides and the illegal visual response that you see. And the bottom line was, after, after they pulled up all the replicated plots, generally there was no effect on yield and no effect on stand. The other part of that, they made a statement. They said, you know, the conditions that are favorable to SDS, yeah, they're the same conditions that were favorable for the visual response with the seed treatment. But the bottom line is that risk definitely is outweighed by the benefits, so they, they still strongly recommend the legal. As far as the PPO herbicides go, um, definitely they felt that, hey, we don't have a lot of ammunition against water hemp in the state, we've got to have that as part of our weed control program. So bottom line, they said, yep, kind of expect to see it once in a while, but yep, we need those type of things out there to, to help us out. So I found some more data the other day, and this happened to be from Kansas State, and the guy in the red was the two years where they had a, actually pretty severe sudden death. And if you look at that, these were resistant varieties and the yield response was from 28 to uh, looks like 40, almost 43 bushels an acre. Nice response. 2014, highly tolerant variety, changed the amount of symptoms you saw and the yields varied from 47 to 58 bushels. Nice response. The top chart was last year's data, 2015. And you can see by variety on the left, whether they were most tolerant or most susceptible, yield responses weren't quite the same, but they ranged from 0.6 to 5.7 bushels in basically a non-SDS year. So the materials do what they say. Um, all I want to do is say, hey, you can see these symptomologies. Kind of expect it in a year where things are tough. It pours and pounds on there. And, in those cool conditions, and that's when you're going to see that. So I was kind of happy to find some data to back up the point that, hey, we're not going to worry about too much. Okay, June comes along. 72nd coolest in 143 years. Well, what does 72nd out of 143 mean? Kind of average, right? Okay, 22nd wettest in 143 years. For the state, it was the 22nd wettest. Okay, let's see how you work. Huh. Depending on where you were at, you were right on that line between the wet part of the state and the dry part of the state. Some of you maybe had farms on both sides. So you got a lot done in one place and you didn't do so well down in this area. So kind of the way things work is that well, you got one number, but then you pick out the individual pockets and you see things change. Kind of like in May, I started to get some phone calls. This was early June. I started getting all these calls. Man, my corn, it's purple. And I'm, I'm evidently not expressing enough concern on the phone. No, it's purple. You can't see them out there. You know? and I'm thinking, OK, yeah, we've had these before. Um, don't get too excited. But you know, what is the cause of purple corn? Anybody? Yeah, phosphorus. If you're, if you're a fertility guy, it's phosphorus. If you went to school and you're a herbicide guy, well, that's carryover screwed up roots. If you're an entomologist, oh, those are insects screwing up roots out there. So it all varies, but the bottom line is there's a lot of things can cause purple corn. And so 
just because one field might be purple, if another one comes along and you see that's purple, don't expect it to be the same thing because it could be dry soils, wet soils, compaction, low phosphorus, insects, herbicides, this year's or last year's. Could be ammonia damage, you know, uh, if you're a little impatient like I am, I might put on ammonia today thinking, well, I'm not going to plant for a week, but the sun's out, the temperature's nice, the soils are right, so what do I do? Go charging out there with a the plant. And I've got that hot zone of ammonia. So, you know, a lot of things can cause it. It was pretty widespread last year. Here's some pictures that I've taken over the years. Every one of them was a call to go look at purple corn. Every one of them was something else. If you look in the upper right, that was a white grub. If you look down in the bottom right, that was a sidewall compaction. Uh, just above that was ammonia. Um, if you look in the middle, that was a herbicide carrier. So everything. And they all look very similar at that early stage. Moving on to July, 27th coolest, 19th wettest. Again, statewide. Let's see how it was in your world. Oh yeah, you were cool. Now, Frank mentioned we're going to be warmer than last year in July, and I'm looking at this chart. Hey, we're bound to be because we were darn cold last year. It was a cold July. So anything, even average, would be warmer than last year. So I agree that the number's probably right. We are going to be warmer than last year. I just don't know how far. Okay, here was the precipitation map. And again, you can kind of see a line there. Depending on whether you were north or south that line, life was pretty good or it was pretty wet. And uh, that trend kind of fell through for the, the whole summer for this northwest part and also the northeast part. There were some periods, and actually up by Spencer, if you know that area, west of Spencer, there's a lot of gravel and sand. There was corn, didn't recover from that. It stayed dry just long enough that some of that took a pretty big hit. Moving on to August. 27th coolest, 21st wettest. Let's see how you guys fare. Oh yeah, you were cool. And, oh, it was kind of wet this time. So this caught that whole western third to a half mile. September comes along, 7th warmest, 50th wettest. Let's see. Oh yeah, we were on the warm side, all in the orange category. And, again, depending on whether you were north or south, you were either wet or you were dry. <laughs> there was that line in there that caught a lot of people. Okay, I'm going to put this up there. I thought this was kind of an interesting uh, slide. I, I stole this from the Iowa State Mesonet site. And what it is, it's a measure of solar radiation. And as you January through December, and naturally those summer months when you get those long days, you get a lot more solar radiation. That's kind of that tan color. That's about the maximum solar radiation you can get for those days during that time frame. The green color is what we received last year. And if you look in August, that's this bit right in through here, over here, you can see it get pretty darn low in many cases. And actually that whole month, there was, we never really got up to where we would be normal. What was causing that? A couple things. What did I just show you? We were wetter than normal, especially if you went in certain directions. What was, else, what was else out there? It might not even be a rainy day or anything, but where's the sun? Yeah, the fire's up north. We had that smoke. And some days it was pretty dark. So, okay, let's, let's put ourselves in that corn plant um, position. Going back to July, what did we say the temperatures were? Cooler than normal or warmer than normal? Cooler. You guys have been farming a while, some of you guys, and if you look back in time, have your yields been more awesome in a cool year or more awesome in a, in a hot, hot year? Warm year, let's say. Not hot, warm. Actually cool. You think about every one of those cool years, yields were, not every one of them because sometimes it didn't rain, but if it tends to be cooler during that pollination period, that month of July, often the yields are pretty good. 2009, we never had any heat units. The yields were awesome, but it just never dried. But, so we kind of took a little heat on that one, but every one of those, 2004, every one of those was a cooler type year. So we had awesome pollination, nice big ears, good ear fill, fill to the tip, so you had high potential. Now here's my factory. These are these leaves sticking out here, and they're collecting, they're the solar panels collecting sunlight, which through photosynthesis, you get sugars developed. Sugars end up in the ear, the kernels. 
So that Kornplatt's entire goal in life in July and August is Phil Kearns, right? Okay, here's my factory. My factory guys are on strike. Where's the sun? It's only working halfway. Is that plant still going to try to fill those kernels? Yep, it's going to do all it can to do that. Where does it get the sugars and things to fill those kernels? If the factory's only putting out half, half production stocks. And so in August, if you happen to attend an answer plot that we have, I was telling guys, you know, I don't want to say that the sky's falling, but boy, I think we need to be out here harvesting on a pretty, pretty early side because these stocks are going to, they're taking a hit. You had areas that were wet, we lost some nitrogen, that didn't help matters. We had clouds and poor sunlight and solar radiation, that doesn't help things. And you had potential for awesome yields. All that makes a scenario for stock problems. So we predicted it, it actually came true in some places. I'm going to switch on you a little bit here. I uh, had a lot of questions after uh, a little bit of ammonia got on and then it, it uh, started raining and it rained and rained and, and everybody was kind of calling, God, did I lose that in? I just spent a bunch of money on nitrogen now. Now it's raining and I don't lose it all. Well, guess what, guys? It also turned cold. And when you look at this, when does nitrification occur? In other words, the conversion of ammonium nitrogen to nitrate. It has to be warm. 50 degree temperatures is kind of that rule of thumb we talked about. It actually occurs below that. But once those soils get cold, that conversion doesn't handle, doesn't take place, so where's the ammonium? It attaches to the clay and organic matter, it doesn't go anywhere. So you could have a puddle out there and it's still sitting there on that clay and organic matter. Now, I can't guarantee what will happen by spring. You know, if we have a warm spring, which according to the forecast, that's not going to happen. But if we did, and then a lot of moisture, you could have conversion before that crop needs to be moved a lot. So I can't predict that. But I think for now, it's pretty much still there. By the way, I didn't say it at the very beginning, but if you got a question, color and screen, if we get through half these slides, that's great. If we don't get through a third of them, that's fine, too. Um, I'm going to give you a few USDA yield reports. I think it's kind of interesting to look at yields. And for the state, we had an awesome yield. They say we had 192 bushel of corn, uh, which is the highest ever for the state. And uh, you can see that nice yield trend due to genetics, due to the things that you guys are doing management-wise. You're planting more uniform stands. It's emerging better. All those things that you're doing, our yields just keep going up. And, and the, the chart shows it. I like to look how we compare it amongst the districts. And you can break this into three, three categories, northern third of Iowa, central third of Iowa, and the southern third of Iowa. Northern third tended out yield the middle third, which definitely beat up on the southern third. What happened to the southern third? Well, <laughs> lots of weather, along with a lot more disease than everybody else had to. I also like to compare it to our neighboring states. And the first three are the I states, Iowa, Illinois, and Indiana. And Indiana and Illinois were getting inundated with rain. We had to have challenges in places, but as a whole, we were able to get out there early, get our crop going, things were off the races. We had a lot better growing season than they did. You can see what happened in Missouri, the second to the last down there. Um, Minnesota and Nebraska came in a little close to us as well. So it means 52.5 bushel. Pretty, pretty awesome yield trend, trending up. Things are improving. I know not everybody believes that, but overall the yields continue to increase. And when you look at the state, again, it's kind of the three-tiered approach. The northern part did a little better than the central part, which definitely beat up on the southern third, especially southwest and south central. Compared to our neighbors, yeah, once things started drying up, Illinois did good on beans. They had an awesome bean here too. Uh, Nebraska, you know, they caught a little rain, so they didn't irrigate a lot of ground in places. And you know, the areas were awesome and on down the road. So, okay, I'm going to switch. Any questions on weather? Okay, I'm going to switch gears and get into kind of a touchy topic here. This is where we're at today. Um, actually, this is a few years ago. Was comparing what happened to your input costs from 2009 to 2013. I know 13 was three years ago already. But 
if you look at that, and I know the numbers don't always agree, but they are right here, but remember this is Nebraska. But you can see fertilizer, seed, and everything, 2 to 9% increase. Equipment and land, 16 to 44% increase. So I got two colored boxes. I got a box in green, I got a box in red. Which one of those has an absolute direct effect on the yield of your field? The green box. And I will admit, if I got a planter that's wore out and it does a lousy job planting, that's going to have a direct effect on yield. So equipment does play a part. But directly affecting yield, fertility, weed control, sweet. Absolutely a direct effect. Where do most people look at trying to, okay, this is the bad scenario, things have changed, price of grain is down, everything else is still pretty inflated. You're trying to find how can I be the most efficient. And, and I'm going to throw myself under the bus here too, just like a lot of other people. I like to go whole hog, one way or the other. That's not the way to make money. And we're going to talk about that a little more here in a minute. But, you know, the green box is where everybody tries to make some changes. And yet the green box is the one that has a direct effect on your yield, which affects your profitability. Now, if you're doing something in the green box that isn't really getting your return on investment, yeah, you need to look at it. But I really caution you and suggest that you really, you know, we all have blinders, I do too, and talk with the guys with new, get more opinions other than just your own. Does this make sense? Doesn't that make sense? Things like that. So um, I'll give you an example where a lot of people went whole hog. Uh, last year in, oh, it would be late July, probably mid-July, late July, what was the corn price doing? Nose that. That was also about the time when we, if we were going to apply corn fungicides earlier, that'd be when we do that. What did a lot of people decide not to do? Well, I'm not going to spend that money. What did we have developed right after we decided to make that decision? High spot, northern corn leaf blight, gray leaf spot, rust. And in many cases, it was an awesome year for fungicides in a lot of areas of the state. And so, just blankly saying I'm not doing it on any of my acres cost many people a lot of money. Not saying do it on every acre, but um, so so I've showed you guys this before. You guys have seen me talk. I showed the Velo data. This is a few years back, but you know they have that enhanced program which was 228 bushels. They had the traditional program which was 185 bushels. But what's neat about his data is now he'll take those inputs that make it an enhanced program and add it to that traditional program, that blue column. The green column, he takes those inputs away one at a time, and only one for each deal. So you see kind of a trend there, adding something versus taking it away from the system. Usually the gain from adding an input to a traditional program is less than what you lose by taking it away from the system. And that's because everything's interacting. If you add more plants out there, you've changed the air movement in the field, you've changed your disease spectrum. If you've added more plants, you maybe change your fertility spectrum. So one thing affects something else. <clears throat> the other sad thing about it is you'd say, okay, I'll look at the data and see which one uh, effect, had the least effect across the board. And what they found in 2009, it was genetics was the big player. If I screwed up on genetics, boy, that hit me bad. 2010 was a fungicide year, kind of like last year. If I didn't put a fungicide on, that cost me big time. If I did put it on a traditional, it gained some. And then in 2011, it was fertility. So this just makes your decision process even uglier. Because you don't know in 2016 what's going to be the heavy hitter. So let's look at some more. This is actually just a demo, this isn't research, but we did a similar plot in the answer plots. And this is just a demonstration, not a, a replicated plot. But when we took starter away from, the from an enhanced system versus side dress versus the population, we dropped, uh, I think it was 6,000 plants. 
and then we had a fungicide that max in polar feed. So you can see as we took something away from the system, we lost some yield. On the eastern half of the state, we had an addition omission. And again, you can see the trend. If you take something away from an enhanced program, you lost more than you gained by adding it to the, to the uh, traditional. The system is pretty important. I'm going to give you a few yield. Uh, this is out of the replicated area. So this is, this is research plots. And out of 32 sites that we had uh, foliar corn fungicides, 93% of those were positive. The yield range of the 32 sites was a negative 3 to 39 bushels. Now, did the fungicide cause a 3 bushel hit? No. But anytime you do things, there's going to be some var variation in the field, and that's just the way it turned out at that plot. The overall average was right at 12 bushels an acre. We also saw that there were differences in hybrids, and it's not saying one hybrid's good or one's bad, but we saw that the cropland 5290, boy, it had a 21 bushel response overall across these plots. The 5806 had a 4.4 bushel response, not near as much. Now, I'd have to go back in the data to see which one yielded the most, and I don't have that, but it shows which one was more responsive. So what I'm getting at, here's, here's the first part of where I'm headed. Does it make sense to just throw everything across the board and say, nope, or yes. It doesn't. In this case, if money's a little bit limited, and I have both these hybrids out there, which one am I going to focus on with the fungicide? That's putting money where I've improved my odds. It's better than next door over here. I've improved my odds that I'm going to make some money. <laughs> I should have knocked over there, but you know, it'll be. <laughs> okay, here was the soybean fungicide research. And 90% of 50 sites showed a positive response, and the range was a negative 1.5 to 8.8. The overall average was just right around three bushels. <laughs> um, we also did a nitrogen uh, demonstration. Uh, this was research too. Um, the rate of end varies across these locations, so I don't I don't have specific numbers, but the overall average of that data, a single single rate of end went 250, and when we split that rate two-thirds with one-third later through a wide drop, we gained six bushels. Now, you know, gain, but you've also got to put into place how much did it cost me to apply it, how much did that form of end cost. That all needs to be part of that equation, but the data said by splitting that in, we did increase yields in, the, in these pods. Some of these would have been wet, some of them would have been dry, it's a little, it's a hot pod of different plots. Okay. Um, back about eight, ten years ago, we did a bunch of research looking at coating, along with the fungicide and the insecticide that's on your corn seed. What did, okay. Was that two minutes or was that? 20. 20 minutes, okay. <laughs> uh, we looked at the seed and we saw, boy, when we added a little bit of zinc in that coating, we had a nice response. But we had not looked at the new genetics. You know, that that we used ten years ago, the genetics have changed drastically. So we really didn't know. So we thought, well, why put money out there with zinc if, if we aren't getting a response with today's hybrids? Well, here's what we found. We grouped it into different 80, 90, 100, 110-day corn. And we still saw a nice response just from that little dab of zinc on the seed, overall of about two and a half bushels. So we're still doing that. We did, we're looking at, a lot of companies are looking at PGRs, high growth regulators. And we've been playing with it for a long time. We currently have one called Ascend out there, but we have a lot of experimentals. We had two that kind of popped up there, statistically different than the others, and we don't know where we're headed with this until we get some more years of data. And the thing with PGRs is that they tend to respond better certain years, they tend to respond better certain areas, and that's what we're trying to get our handle around um, before we really come out with those. Okay, so going back to what we were at earlier, where are we going to go for 2016? A lot of decisions are already made. There's a lot of decisions to be made. Those decisions we need to make that don't cut, they might cut our costs, but if they cut profits, that wasn't a good decision. So that, it's a tough one. So I guess what I'm suggesting is work with all the data that's out there. The seed companies that are out here, the 
The new co-op people have a lot of their own data. Cropland has the answer plot system where we have data. And we, we know through replicated data that some of these hybrids respond differently to nitrogen. We know that some respond differently to population. We know some respond differently to fungicide. We know absolutely if you plant the wrong hybrid on a can of steel soil, you're in big trouble. Because that is wet, poorly drained, high pH, the wrong hybrid or variety, what one talk means here. You just made a major blunder and cost you big money. So data-driven decisions are much better than just, well, all in or all out, we don't know. So the other thing I'd like to suggest is that we all have variable fields. Unfortunately, there's variability in the fields, and sometimes it's, it's a hodgepodge, but we have those fields that we know we can depend on. Year in, year out, they treat us good. I think last year was a prime example that in many of those good fields, we had awesome yields, but I bet we could have tweaked out another 5, 10, 15 bushels by doing some things to those and made money out of it. We have a lot of acres that we call the average acre. Yeah, they're pretty good. You know, sometimes they're better than others, but you know, these are the fields that I don't go full bore with right from the get-go, but now during the season, if it's been a little wetter than normal, maybe I'll put a little side dress on there, if there's some disease in there. I, I look through the season and make decisions as I go on those acres. And then you got the tough acres. And, the, and you heard the uh, very first presentation this morning, over where I live, over by Sioux City, Woodbury County, the tough acres are going where? <coughs> CRP. <coughs> you can't afford not to. I mean, some of those contracts are huge for CRP over there. So there, there is a lot of land going into that. But, but if you're going to farm those tough acres that have consistently not been good for you, why put these huge amount of inputs on them? You know, instead of saying it's all or nothing, why not treat it as a conservative acre, knowing that if I spend money there, I've got to be really really important that it makes sense because this thing's never very good for me. And, and that's the way to treat that tough acre. So let's look at it a little bit closer. In our replicated plots, we actually have a response to nitrogen and a response to population from the different hybrids. And that includes cropland, cacao, uh, mycogen, NK, and there's some pioneer numbers in there as well. Then what we do is we rank them in on the lower axis to the far right, those are hybrids that when we add nitrogen, what we basically call it unlimited nitrogen, man versus limited nitrogen, there's a huge difference in the two yields. So on the left-hand column, that'd be a low rate of N versus the unlimited N. And that crop, that corn plant treats you well with that unlimited N. On the other hand, the other axis, the vertical axis, that population, and I think it's a six or 6,000 population difference between the high and the low. And what they see is that some hybrids respond very well to that population, some not enough to justify that at seed. So if I spend more money on seed to plant 38,000, when that hybrid does well at 32,000. There's all kinds of those out there. So they're kind of grouped here. I put my best acres where I know when I do things, I do things aggressively, that field's always been good to me. Maybe I can tweak a little more out of there. So here's some hybrids that fit into that group. Those average acres, the acres where I'm going to kind of do okay, treat them pretty good, but I'm going to monitor it during the season. Well, hey, that's kind of the middle. And then those for those tough acres, hey, I'm going to pick something that not real responsive to nitrogen, not real responsive to population. I'm going to keep my costs down a little bit there. Maybe I won't lose as much on those acres. This chart's ugly, it's hard to read, and it's not knocking any hybrids, but it's positioning in the column in the left, there's 30 hybrids, the same one in each column. The one on your left is a, is a, a fine textured soil, the middle column is a middle textured, like silk loam, and then the one on the right is a uh, sandy, coarse textured soil. If you look at the blue circles, 60, 65, it was in the upper part of that based on yield, the yields were highest, and basically compared to all these others, it was at the top in all situations. Another hybrid did really well on these type of soils, but didn't belong down here on a coarse soil. So again, if you position these incorrectly, 
we could be losing money. Let's look at nitrogen. This is an ugly chart too, I realize. You can't read it, I can't read it. Um, the blue arrow says 6265, smart step. This, the first two columns are unlimited nitrogen, high pot, low pot. The next two columns are limited nitrogen, high pot, low pot. So look at 6265 in the first two columns where there's unlimited N, it's in the upper half of the plot. But where is it when I limited the nitrogen? You know, let's say I have a field where I just can't control the nitrogen. You know, I always lose my nitrogen on that. Or maybe, maybe I just don't want to spend a lot of money on this field. Well, that is a hybrid not to do that with because you're going to lose your shorts doing that. On the other hand, here's another hybrid, 6110. Middle of the pack when you had lots of nitrogen out there. Where was it when we limited the nitrogen? Top of the pack, upper, upper quarter of that group of hybrids. So again, a little information can help you position these things and help me know, well, if I am planting that 60, 65, and I've had some wet years, and I'm going to side dress some of my acres, not all my acres, some of the acres, which hybrid would you do that with? I'm not going to do it with 6110. I'm going to side dress that 62. Why? Because it's showing me it, it responds to that nitrogen. The other one, not saying it doesn't need in, but it isn't quite so important. Okay, so best acres, I think, challenge those acres. They've been good to you. Those are the ones that give you a return on the investment. The average acres, hey, treat them kind of average. You know, don't don't just eliminate things, but as you go through the season, if it looks like it's wetter than normal and your your uh, disease pressure is coming, if that happens to be a hybrid that responds well to fungicide, boy, I'm going to put a fungicide on it. And then your tough acres, don't go a whole hog on these. <laughs> kind of watch it. Okay, switch gears on you. I'm kind of quiet. I hope I'm not putting you to sleep there. <laughs> um, I got a line here, and that's a starter line. I realize we're not in starter country. But there's a lot of good data behind starters. Doesn't always mean you get a yield to response, but more times than not, you do. And if you look at our replicated trials, if we had a warm season, a warm planting season, 50% of the plots respond. Flip a coin, that's not very good odds. If we had a cold spell, cold planting, 77% of the plots responded, and we had an average seven bushel response. So again, are you planting in no-till conditions in April? or you tend to plant tilt conditions in May will make a difference on whether this start start help or doesn't. We also got a lot of data on, on, on PGRs and starter. The PGR, this was a sin, so all these trials had starter. The five bushel over 2,000 reps was actually just adding a sin to it. I'm gonna ask Jeffrey to come up because he's did some plots with the growth regulars in your area. So what we did here was all that small plot work and the answer plots is small plots. So what I did with your customer base in regions one through four is we did like 50, 60 acre plots and did the same thing. So we had 23 of them, seven with corn, 17 with soybeans at that R3, 276 side time frame. So on the corn side, I've only got three to seven back so far. Um, average yield response was 6.6 6 .6 bushels advantage. We've seen stand difference of 1,500 plants across all seven of the trials. Those are some pictures all at the same location and just kind of see from start to begin or start to end how the root mass has changed. This is the same field, that picture on the bottom left is kind of hard to see, but it actually tasseled two or three days prior and then we actually got a call from the farmer telling us to come out and look at it because something was going on. That's kind of how we found that one out. Still the same thing with this scent on the, on the left, untreated on the right with road masses. Here's a soybean project that we did. So fungicide insecticide time, we kind of targeted the grower that was going to get fungicide insecticide already. Um, we had 13 of the 17 trials back. On average, it was a three and a half bushel increase. So the way we went and did these was we tried to get the grower or the agronomist to come out and take five consecutive plants in each part of the sections. We took pictures with the leaves on them, stripped the leaves so you can kind of see the pods a little bit more. Development up in the top part of the nodes, and then I threw them in a bucket because I wasn't going to try to do a yield estimate on soybeans. 
just so you can kind of see the difference in what they compare to that. So this one was a uh, grower just outside of Camero, and he did it at three different rates. So we have them on the far left where it was fungicide and insecticide. In the middle was fungicide and insecticide, four ounces of a cent. And on the far right was fungicide and insecticide, six ounces of a cent. And we actually found out that the six was probably a little bit too much based on the yield results that we had back. The yield map for that field is on the far right. So on the top, you can see that was where the untreated was. In the middle where that blue section was, that was where the four ounces of the send was. And then on the bottom was where the six ounces were. And on the same thing on the left-hand yield map, on the top field, you can see that red border around there. That was where the ascend was treated in that trial in particular. Thanks, Jeff. Okay, so moving on, um, here I have sort of a question at you. I've got purple corn on the left and ice cream corn on the right. What do you expect we're talking about here? Now, I showed you a list of 30 things it could be, but in this case, it is starter and no starter because we're talking starter. <laughs> okay, uh, another thing just to be a little aware of, uh, a lot of people will like to put in a little bit of zinc in their starters, and uh, there's a lot of different kinds out there. In this picture, we're showing orthophosphate phosphate starters, and we're showing a bunch of zinc. And uh, you know, zinc is not necessarily all the same. And so I got four beakers there. Three of them, you can see that cloudiness. The last one there in the lower right-hand corner, you can't see anything. And that cloudiness is actually precipitates. Now, is that good or bad in a starter? It's bad because if it gets cold at night, and some of us plant. And you know, April, I plan as early as April 10th, most of the time it's the 20th, but we get cold at night. How big are those starter lines? Little bitty things. Well, guess what? When it gets cold, things fall out. Here, this stuff's falling out, and this is room temperature. And so, there are some products that definitely mix better, stay mixed with others better. Uh, some of these can be mixed with 1030 for better.